My guest today has lived 102 years on this earth. She's a remarkable woman. He said, to be truly alive, we must find the life force within ourselves and direct our energy towards it. I mean that we all have it, but something that we just, just have not introduced ourselves to because we've been so busy looking outside and don't realize that inside the very core of our being is what keeps us happy. Life by itself, it can't do anything until love activates it, cracks the shell, and the energy comes out, and the two become one. It's like a sperm and an ovum. A sperm by itself and an ovum by itself can't do anything, but when they connect, life comes forth. Laughter with love is joy and happiness. Labor without love is, oh man, there are too many diapers, I gotta go to work. It's really hard, but labor with love is bliss. It's what makes you happy. It's what makes the singer sing, what makes the painter paint. Labor is there, I mean, you know it's there, but when you approach it with the whole force of love, it booms. Listening without love, is empty sound, but listening with love is understanding. That might be the most profound and beautiful thing ever said on my show. Okay, welcome back to the show, everybody. Today's an honor for me. Uh, today's all going to be about really wisdom. And my, my guest today uh, has 102 years worth of that wisdom. Yep. My guest today has lived 102 years on this earth. She's a remarkable woman. She's a mother, I believe, of six children. Uh-huh. She is also a doctor. She also met Gandhi. And she has a book out that is just extraordinary called The Well-Lived Life, 102-Year-Old Doctor, Six Secrets to Health and Happiness at Every Age. So Dr. Gladys McGarry, welcome finally to my show. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> it's my absolute honor to do this today with you. So I have so many things I want to ask you. So let's just get right into it. We got a hundred. Right, let's do it. <laughs> 102 years worth of stuff to get out in an hour. So here we go. <laughs> you said something. You said, if I could distill my life's work and you nailed it down here, you said to be truly alive, we must find the life force within ourselves and direct our energy towards it. That sounds like an awful new age thing to say, and I'm wondering what you meant by that when you said it. I mean that we all have it. Hmm. So it's something that we just, just have not introduced ourselves to because we've been so busy looking outside for our fix-its hmm. and the things that make us happy or whatever we think that has to be outside of ourselves and don't realize that inside the very core of our being is what keeps us happy as a matter of fact i just learned a while back that the welsh when they get up in the morning and meet somebody they don't say good morning they say how's your weird really because the weird that they're talking about is this inner core of our being that is the, the thing that really keeps us going our life force mm. i call it the physician within but it's that life force that really uh is the engine that keeps the thing going is that what you mean about the juice of life because you also by the way it's amazing i've not really heard anybody else use that term i've been using the term about getting the juice out of something or the juice of life now for probably 30 years is that what you mean by really? that? I have. As I was yeah. fascinating when I was reading your work, I'm like, oh my gosh, the juice of life. So is yeah. that connected to the life force or is it Absolutely. something more specific? Okay. No, it, it's, it's definitely connected to the life force because it's what juices are a lot. You know, if we don't have any juice, we're just kind of, uh, oh, you know, it's very sad. Well, I think most people, I, maybe you would agree. I shouldn't say most because that's a judgment, but you you say that the juice has two main parts our individual essence and then how we fit into the whole and if i think about our culture today i wonder how many people listening to this right now go you know i haven't tapped into my life force and i i don't get a lot of the juice out of life so could you elaborate on that our individual essence what a beautiful way to say it and how we fit into the whole if we start paying attention to some of the things that make us happy that make us want to 
dance and sing that want makes sometimes just make you want to yell. If something has happened and you really don't like it very well. It's okay to go about yourself and just holler sometime. <laughs> you yeah. know, sometimes we need to express ourselves in a way that we can understand it, hmm. where we can understand what it is that that I'm trying to say to myself. You know, this 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 either is really it's so good and I like it so well, or it really makes me sad, or it's however it's acting us. Uh, however we're reacting, whatever it is, mm. is our way of responding to life. Does that mean that you think that, you know, the full expression of your emotions matters? Meaning, like, I, I've had this theory for a while that I don't even know that there are positive or negative emotions. They're just our emotions. And that sometimes... They're emotions. Yeah, it's energy. Energy is energy. And mm. sometimes it's... Sometimes it just doesn't feel very good, and sometimes it feels great. But whatever it is, if we can begin to say, "Oh, yes," <laughs> or "No, no, no," I, 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 and we back away from it, it's something that guides us from within ourselves, that allows us to know what is what we're responding to and how we're responding to it. How do you figure that out, Gladys? How, how do you? I how do you figure that out? How do you know why you're, you know, I'm a big believer in self-awareness. Yeah. Some of that just comes, I think, maybe with age, because you've been around yourself a little bit longer. You know, I know more about myself at 52 right now than I certainly did at 22. Yeah, but, but you pay, you've been paying attention to it. And a lot of times at 100, haven't been paying attention to it and still don't feel it. You know, how, does, how do you do that? How do you pay more attention? Is it is it a, a little bit... Is it a little quiet time? Is it is just is it starting to take note of how you behave and what your patterns are? How does one begin to do that? It it I I think it's an individual thing, so it's hard to say blanket mm. how. But when you begin to pay attention to what makes you respond to something, yes. even a person or or a poem or a song or or a flower, you know, sometimes a rose will just say, oh, you know, ooh, that's great. You know, it's it's the awareness of how we respond to the inside and outside of ourselves. You're then right. we become part of a community. I think so many people, and by the way, I have for many years, and sometimes I regress, but I kind of have a, like an autopilot human being. And... So the same things generate the same responses from me, no matter what the conditions of my life are. Sometimes I feel like I still find a way to get those same emotions. And in the book, you teach a way to do this and, and you label it right. with five L's. It's just sort of like a way to look at your life, right? Like these yeah. five L's. Could you, I just, I never even heard any of this before. And I've read a lot of books and had hundreds of podcasts. So this is really important, everybody, what she's about to say, because it's kind of a way to actually measure or look at your life. So what are the foundational L's? What are those? Well, I like to use the word foundation because they kind of, for me, when I when I came across them, I don't know how I came across, when I came across <laughs> them, they kind of gave me some foundation from which I could begin to talk about some of the things that I wanted to express either to myself or to outside. The five L's all <clears throat> start with life. The first one is life. Life by itself has, it, it can't do anything. It's mm. like a, a seed in a pyramid that's been there for 5,000 years. It's got all the energy of the universe within it, but it can't do anything until love, which in the, would be in the form of water or sunlight or something, love activates it, cracks the shell, and the energy comes out, and the two become one. It's like a sperm and an ovum. A mm -hmm. sperm by itself and an ovum by itself can't do anything. Mm -hmm. But when they connect, life comes forth. That's, yes. that's what happens. Yes. And when life comes forth, then we begin to in, 
involve ourselves. Yeah. We involve ourselves with life. Mm. And as we do that, then we go up to the third L, which is laughter. Mm. Laughter by itself is cruel. It's mean. It's it can be hard and and you know and rough and rude, but laughter with love is joy and happiness. And labor is the fourth one. Labor without love is oh man, there are too many diapers. I gotta go to work. It's just like you know, it's really hard. But labor with love is bliss. Oh it's what makes you happy. It's what makes me happy. It's what makes the singer sing, what makes the painter paint. I mean, it's that inner core within us. Labor is there. I mean, you know it's there. But mm -hmm. when, when you approach it with the whole force of love, mm -hmm. it blooms. Wow. And the fifth one is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. The cl clanging gong, you know. It's empty sound, but listening with love is understanding. Oh my gosh. So as we use these as kind of the five, uh, part of the foundation of what love is, what life is all about, it kind of has allows us place to put things where, where they belong in some kind of order. I have to tell you, um, that might be the... I'm I'm sorry, I get a little emotional with that one. That might be the most profound and beautiful thing ever said on my show. Ever. <laughs> ever. Um that's the foundation <laughs> of life is love. That, the takes my lo that takes my breath away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I uh I mean it. It's the foundation of life is love. And to add to that life, laughter, labor, and listening with love. My gosh, what a what a remarkable formula and how beautifully said by the way i use the word bliss all the time also <laughs> i feel like i have this long last lost friend that i'm meeting today um, <laughs> thank you for that gift i'm curious if you went back all the way back and you could give the little girl some advice on her life you go back all the way back to i don't know the 12 year old gladys and she was embarking upon this long life she's going to live would there be any specific advice you would give her now that you've lived 102 years that I guess through you giving it to her, you can give it to all of us. Was there something you would tell her that you would whisper to her about her life and her in particular that you would want her to know before she goes out into the world and, and lives this thing? Yeah, definitely. I tr tried to tell her that she's really a kind of a nice person and she's not a dumbbell. Well, when I, <laughs> until I started school, Life was wonderful. We lived in tents out in the jungle, and my parents were doing the medical work. And life, you know, I, it for me, life was just the way it was supposed to be. And then I started school, and I couldn't read or write. The letters were all over the place. The numbers were all over the place. I just absolutely could not read or write. Oh my so, God! Are you dyslexic? Severely. Oh my gosh. Wow. Are you? No, I am not. But I'm sitting here talking to the mother of holistic medicine. She becomes a medical doctor at a time where not very many women were doing that. She writes a book <laughs> and she's telling me she's dyslexic after she's lived this life. I'm just sitting here going, oh my gosh. Well, you know, I was so severely dyslexic that I had to repeat first grade twice because a teacher la labeled me the class dummy. Oh my gosh. And so I was really I was fight I was a good fighter. My second oldest brother taught me how to I could punch people out. And so people <laughs> were <laughs> so I, it was, you know, it was in fact I remember being you I said twelve years old, being about that age, ten or twelve, waking up one morning and saying to myself, there's something wrong in this world, Gladys. You don't have a friend. Hmm. And then I said to myself, and why don't you have a friend? Hmm. And I said, well, you know, you punch people out if they say something. And and that's, that's not, I don't think it's working. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and then I said, and who do you know that doesn't do that? Mm. And I realized it was my mother. Mm. My mother was the kind of person, if something happened and um, she didn't like it or, or something, she would deal with it either with humor or just let it go. Mm. And it was something that I... And she had friends all over the place. I mean, she, everybody loved my mother. She would, everybody knew that she accepted them and life was good. In fact, um, she was the kind of person, I remember being as a 12 year old again, sitting at our dining room table when my mother was going to have a tea party and her, her fancy ladies were coming to tea. This is in India, up in the Himalayas, okay. <clears throat> So I hear my mother go to the front door and because I had my stuff all over the table and it was a mess. And my mother says to the ladies as they're coming through, don't look straight ahead. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. <laughs> go straight ahead. And they go marching through and into the parlor and they have a wonderful tea party. And I'm sitting there embarrassed because my mother <laughs> did this. <laughs> but what a wonderful thing that happened. But then something happened, you know, I first and second grade were just terrible. But third grade was different. I had a teacher who saw something in me that the others had. And so she appointed me class governor. I couldn't read or write, but I could do other stuff. Mm. And she saw that in me. And so I was class governor. And then I had the opportunity to present stuff that our class did to the whole student body. And so, so at one point we had a um, play that was, and it was, the play was the, the um, what was it, jumped over, the frog jumped over the, uh, t- uh, frog jumped over the pond. And since I was the biggest one in the class, it's, I, was, I had an extra ear here. I could jump over this pan of water that they had and I was really confident, but I knew I could do this. So I come marching out on the stage and I look over into the audience and my two older brothers are sitting there and it just threw me off my steps enough that when I jumped over the pod, I landed in it, not <laughs> over it. And my mother had made me this frog suit. Uh, she dyed it green and all this. So I'm standing there the green is fading and I'm in tears and I can't move. And the audience is hysterical. Oh. Everybody's just laughing, laughing. And I can't move. So the teacher comes, takes me off the stage. And and, and I go home totally humiliated. And we're sitting at the dinner table. My brothers are telling my mother this just great thing. You know, it was just hysterical. Finally, my mother says to them, all right, boys. You've had your fun now. What are we as a family going to do to help Gladdy? So if this ever happens to her again, people won't laugh at her. They'll laugh with her. Mm. And that has stayed with me throughout my life because there have been many. I, you know, this dyslexia thing keeps, keeps you off. It's hard to keep right in the center of things. You get off balance easily. I so I've stripped and tripped and fallen on stage and always been able to pick it up. And I'd have the audience in my hand before I ever said a thing. Oh, and good. so it was uh, one of these huge life learning experiences. Mm-hmm. And t- another thing that was really, really interesting when we started the american holistic medical association first of all it took us two years to decide how to spell it because (laughs) we were looking for the word health healing and holy because what was missing in medicine at that point was the spirit we -hmm. had the mind and the body but we didn't have the spirit so but we got it in two years and we got it and so on but one day there were 10 of us who were part of the, this group that started sitting around a table and six of us were severely dyslexic. You're kidding me. My I'm not God. kidding. And so we said to each other, that's why we started this. It must be because we 
in order to read, I don't know how I learned to read. You know, I really don't. I have no idea. And they didn't, some of them had some ideas, which I didn't particularly agree with, but, <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing. But we decided that it was because we were looking for something beyond the yeah. reading, writing, and arithmetic yeah, uh, aspect really. of things. Yeah, I have to say something to you. There's so much to unpack there. The first thing is when you go back to the 12-year-old you, a version of that advice is something I hope everybody in the audience gives themselves. Right. Which is first, first part of it is, hey, you're a pretty good person. And just that reminder, you're a pretty good person. Yeah. And and then the second piece of it is kind of the second part was give yourself a break. Yeah. Give yourself a break. You know what? You're a little bit better than you think you are. Yeah. And I got to tell you, if I could go back to the 12 year old me, I would tell me, I would say, you know what? You're a good man. You, yeah. you care about people. You're kind and yeah. you're giving. And you know what? You're not so bad, man. All these yeah. things that you know are so bad about you. Those are actually the things. And then the third lesson is that this woman becomes an MD at the time, you know, she's the mother of holistic medicine, number one, but she ends up doing this at a time where this is just not something that very many women were doing at the time. And she does this now to know that you were severely dyslexic. And now to know that when you founded this group, that the people around the table also shared what most people would think is this deficiency, which ends up to be a gift because it probably caused you to work harder, be more diligent and think beyond as you beyond. Said. Yeah. And those are all the things in life. We all think our limitations or what we think are our limitations. These are the things that steal the juice from our life to go back to the juice. We think, oh, this limitation I have is why I'm not going to do it. Well, most humans lose the juice of their life because they're so familiar with their deficiencies and not, right. their, and not their possibilities. Yeah. Not yeah. their possibilities. And you say something she has in this book, six profound principles for living. And the first one is, this is just, you don't always hear a doctor say this, but you said you are here for a reason. And I'm curious why that was the first thing you listed of the six. Because if you don't get that, you, where do you put the others? Hmm. You know, if, if, if you don't realize that you really have a reason to be here, for me, it's kind of like a huge jigsaw puzzle. And we're each a piece in that jigsaw puzzle. And if you've ever had a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and got it all done and you couldn't find that last piece, it drives you crazy, you know? We all are that important to the whole. The whole is not complete if we don't recognize ourselves as as whole. My youngest son, who is an a, uh, uh, ophthalmologist in Flagstaff, came down. We were talking one time, and he says, you know, there's a guy up in Flagstaff. He doesn't like me. He says, I don't understand that. I like me. <laughs> <laughs> way, I thought, that's, I thought, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that means you did your job right. That's what that oh, means. Yeah. Because that's not... <laughs> That's not true for most people. By the way, guys, I'll just give you a couple of the other ones. Two is all life needs to move. Third, love is medicine. And fourth, this is a big one if you could speak to it, because I think so many people feel alone. Oh, and you yeah. said, four, you are never truly alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you just take the time to, to really look at that, you aren't. There's always some life moving around you. And it's 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 the whole process of life. Even if, you know, during the, during the pandemic and so on, people were feeling alone. One of the reasons they were feeling alone was because they had never had this experience before of being isolated like that. And for a lot of people, it was a soul awakening. Whereas prior to that, they may have felt like they didn't fit into a community or something, but the community was always there, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they always had something that they could reach out to whether they wanted to or not. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that the pandemic did was to give people the awareness yes. that they needed each other. Yes. Yes. And, and here's another great thing that I think is really interesting. I have a friend who's a, a 
visionary and a psychic in Virginia Beach, um, Rosalie, she, I was talking to, she and I were talking one time about um, manifesting something or other that we were trying to manifest. And she said, you know, I think that there's another word that we really need to use. She says, that's femifesting. What does that mean? She says, we manifest things and we think that we have to manifest things. Mm -hmm. But where is the feminine aspect of this? Yeah. We need to femifest. So <laughs> as we talked about it, we realized that manifesting is like climbing Jacob's ladder. You you get into first grade and then you you know you climb the ladder and you get up the where that's manifesting. But femifesting is like a spiral. You can be on the fifth level uh, and you know what's going on down the second level. Mm -hmm. Women know that. You know, you can be uh, have a baby in one arm trying to do dishes in another and to mm -hmm. take care of the one on the floor. The um, difference in the feminine energy and the masculine energy, which we need both. In fact, I had the reason we started talking about this is I had a dream. I had this dream where I woke up, there was a huge crash, mm -hmm. and I woke up and I looked and I was in the high Himalayas in a valley and on the one side there was a young woman just lying there almost dead just mm -hmm. barely breathing and on the other side the left side there was a man in armor doing the same thing and I heard the voice saying this energy these in, these two have been doing this mm -hmm. for eons it's time they did this. And by the way, if you were listening, she did her fists together and then put her hands together. Come together is what she's right. saying. Yeah. And I realized when I began thinking about it that the the girl was on the left on the right side, which is the masculine side, mm -hmm. and the man was on the left side, all in armor and everything, mm -hmm. and they were been for eons fighting. And so that's when we came up with this Femifest and Manifest. Well, it's about to go to millions of people right now. So now I can already see the hats and the T-shirts and all this stuff being printed. <laughs> how do we do this today? And I you know to... what happens with a pregnancy? Hmm. The egg and the sperm come together and life happens. Hmm. They're, a, a egg by itself is, you know, what's it going to do? Right. sperm by itself what it's going to do but when they get together life happens so good. and that's manifestation so pregnancies are femifesting and <laughs> <laughs> so good. You know? i have to tell you i'm sitting here just going uh i don't do very many shows like this where i go i want to listen to this one back right away i knew this would be good today but i didn't know it would be i, I knew your depth but i didn't know you're this deep and after you've lived a little bit, you have a tremendous appreciation for the things Gladys is talking about. And you said something there. I don't want to miss skip over. You said, I spend time with my dreams. What what, uh -huh. you, what, what, what do you mean by that? I'm just curious. Is that something you've done all your life or? Well, I didn't. Uh, yeah. You know, we used to talk about our dreams when we were kids and all that. And uh, my mother didn't discourage us. But as I you think they have meaning gladys oh wow yes i in fact guidance and and all of that in mm -hmm. fact i i really didn't understand that i had a voice until i was 93 now that didn't mean that i wasn't using my voice but i didn't really uh respect it until i was 93 <laughs> i'm just so <laughs> help me this is true and <laughs> because I was dyslexic and I was a dummy. You, you know, you don't realize how some of these uh, ambiguous pains happen to you when you're Young. little and you, you, you know, you're the damaged one. You know, I was forever asking somebody else to validate it until I had this dream. I was watching nine-year-old Gladys. Okay. And we were in the, in the, tents in the jungles where we had grown up and in our family on Sunday mornings 
we were not supposed to sing anything but hymns or bhajans. And as this nine-year-old smart aleck, I thought that was the stupidest thing, and I wanted to sing whatever I wanted to sing. And so I saw myself pulling the tap, fed tent flap back and looking out to see that my little brother wasn't there because he'd tattle on me, and then I'd have, you know, mm -hmm. so <laughs> I had to get out. And he wasn't there, so as fast as I could, I ran, and I climbed up my the, the mango tree that was out there, and I'm sitting up at the top, and I'm singing, oh, man, I'm singing the caterpillar song or any old thing that came into my head and just having the best time. And every so often, I look over my right shoulder, and Jesus is up in the tree with me. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is laughing, and I look at him, and I say, Jesus loves the little children, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's laughing. And he says, yes. And so I go back to my singing, and then I get to doubting it, you know, and I think, you better check again. So I look back, and I say, I'm still a little children, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes. So I go back to my singing, and I wake up, and I wake up singing and laughing. Oh my gosh. And it was a Sunday morning here. Oh, my. So it tied all this in, and at that point, I said, Gladys, you have a voice. You have to start claiming it. Oh, my gosh, Gladys. Are you... It's that's, true. That's amazing. The idea that when we're little, these wounds stay with us till we're 93 or beyond uh, is an absolute fact. The idea that you listen to your dreams, what a lesson for everybody here. And this idea that you find your voice at 93 is absolutely extraordinary. And by the way, thank God you did, because I wouldn't be with you here today if you didn't find that voice. Yeah, well, it was important to me. When I realized what I realized was that every time I deflected what I had said to somebody else, I was denying what I said. My gosh, Gladys, there's millions of people right now that are crying. I can promise you going, that's me. I need someone's validation. I need their approval. Yes. Before I, I, need, I need permission in yes. my life. And yeah. not and, and not everybody, Gladys, is going to be as blessed and as fortunate as you to be here for the 93 years and to the 102 years. So they better figure it out right now, listening to your wisdom, that they don't need validation or permission. No. And they have a voice because they may not get a chance to figure that out in the 93rd year. That's absolutely true. You need to, you know, we are, I am me, you are you. And there isn't anybody else in between us except the whole world, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's we're there and we bump up uh, with each other and, and find each other. And I couldn't begin to do this if my son didn't do the technical, you know, we're yeah. totally dependent on each other. Let me tell you, my eldest son um, is a, a retired orthopedic surgeon. But when he finished his uh, surgery, he was came through Phoenix and he was going down to Del Rio, Texas to st start his practice. And he says, Mom, you know, I'm I'm real worried. He said, I have all this training and everything and I'm going out into the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think that you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But if you can understand that you have this amazing training with the orthopedic surgery that you have gotten and you spent all of this time doing, you need to keep that and keep doing it and then turn the healing of it over to the physician within the patient. Mm. Because you can do everything that you do, but if the patient doesn't accept it, and doesn't do what you have, are telling them or work with you with it, and you haven't even accepted the fact that 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 they can do that. Mm. There's a there's a gap. So mm. in a whole process of healing, we all need if in in the field of medicine, we all need to respect the physician within the patient as our colleague. I I think Gladys I. Uh... I'm sitting here thinking, I wish I was giving a, a seminar and a speech with you. 
because I don't, I think I know what you mean too. And it's not just, it's the field of medicine, it's the field of life. Yes. That there's this, there's this physician within us. Now for me, oh. that's, that's God living within us, but whatever Absolutely. your beliefs are, and I know you believe that too, that, 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 that's the healer. That's the one where you, you can do everything you can and you just separate from the outcome and just let things happen the way that they're naturally supposed to happen in life. And too many people, I think sometimes it's actually an ego. Actually, a, even if you might think there's humility involved, you think you're, you, you control everything. There's got to be an element in your life where you do your part. And you actually say this number five in the book yeah. Yeah. is everything's your teacher. And I want you to talk about it. But for me, maybe about 15 years ago, I, I stopped trying to control every outcome. I stopped looking at everything as a win or a loss. Uh -huh. And I started to look at myself more as a learner and more as a curious person. That didn't mean I don't want to produce a result. I'm driven. I'm ambitious. But uh, when I started to position myself as this life's an experience and and the things in my life I'm going to learn from. Now you flip it and talk about everything is your teacher. So I want you to share that wisdom as well. If you're stuck in a place and for, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you don't understand that this is here for a reason. In fact, that's what's happened to the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. We think, uh, see, I was, I went through medical school during the war. I started World War II. World War Two. I started in uh, in September, and the war started in December. So, all those years, and it was all about uh, trying to get rid of an enemy. And there were the two enemies that were so huge were the enemies that we were, we were fighting against. But in the field of medicine, when I got out of the, out of the medical school we still had two enemies and those enemies were disease and pain and so those were we're still trying to do that eliminate the disease and pain i'm so committed to having in this world a loving birth place where babies can be born in a loving in environment not something that's just trying to kill pain because when i was in medical school we were doing twilight sleep mm -hmm. my first two sons i delivered with twilight sleep and i didn't know i had a son until 24 hours later because all the pain was taken away every not all the pain just everything was taken away it was completely gone and the baby had to be delivered with forceps mm. <clears throat> so i was really good at that i could i could deliver you know deliver a a baby with after coming head and all and mm. i've tried i've realized now that what we did with that whole process of taking away the pain is we've taken away the power from our very women, and we talk about having to be delivered of our babies. We don't have to be delivered of our babies. Women need to birth their babies. And I have to constantly, I'm so many years I talked about delivering babies. We deliver pizzas and we deliver speeches. We don't deliver babies. Women birth their own babies. But we are there to support them and help them and work with them and be part of the world that the baby comes into. Yeah. I was just thinking about a really good friend of mine is doing a home birth. She just decided to do a home uh, yeah. in a loving environment. And you know, a lot of people actually believe the birthing experience affects the emotional well-being of the child as well. Oh, absolutely. But I also think about people out there that want to birth their dreams. And the fact that, you know, there's a necessity for pain to go through that, that oh. dream. Your dream's not delivered to you. You birth your dream. And there's going to be pain involved. And it's part of the experience of birthing your life and birthing your dream is the pain. And the, the notion that you just remove all of the pain removes the experience. Because when you get to the other side of your life and you do write that book that you finally write or you make that dream happen, it's some of the pain and the discomfort and the learning that you went through that makes it so worthwhile. 
And if you stripped out all the pain and all the learning and all the experience, it's just the result instead of the the journey, the experience that you have. I'm so fascinated by you. I I, um, <laughs> I want to ask you a question, if you don't mind. This is probably a little bit intrusive, but I do, and I'm only 52. Do oh, you think you're a about, baby. Well, I, by the way, I feel so good to have somebody that's 50 years older than me on my show because usually <laughs> most of the time I'm the oldest guy on my show. But I, I wonder if you think about the end of your body in this life. Do you think about those things if you do what are your thoughts about them do you fear it do you want to run full speed towards it do you never think about it or does thinking about that give you some of that juice in life to live and be present for today yes at last <laughs> yeah because uh my sister well i've had experience with death that is so um inspiring that i don't you know like okay i'll tell you you my sister she was two years older than me and uh she wasn't a fighter she was a peacemaker in our family <laughs> she was hey. a little child and you know uh she was that always throughout her whole life she was so she was 98 when she was when she passed over and um She'd been healthy and well until she got the flu, and then she just didn't get over it. And so um, just as she was, her youngest son and his wife were with her as she made the transition. And she was lying in bed <clears throat> and started singing. And she started singing uh, hymns and bhajans, which are Indian hymns. And... As she started, first her voice was weak, but it got stronger as she kept singing. And every so often she'd say, and Aya is here. Now, Aya was our, well, she was like our second mother. She was this Indian woman. She was mm -hmm. uh, totally illiterate and everything, but she was the one that encompassed us in love and all that, you know. Mm. My mother was busy with her practice, but Aya was always there. Well, Aya taught us how to play the Indian dholak, the dumb two-sided mm. drum. Mm. But she tried to teach me, but I wouldn't sit still long enough. But she taught Margaret. Mm. And so she's, Margaret saying, Aya is here. And in my mind, <laughs> mm. I, I can see them moving over to whatever their the scope of heaven is that they're moving into singing and drumming as they go mm. you know and to me mm. what could be more beautiful than that my gosh my and gosh. and you know there are other times when i've watched people make the transition and 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 they've communicated with me from the other side. Mm. And, you know, there's stories that go on. I, I don't think, see, I know that the baby in the uterus knows what the mother's doing. Mm. I mean, the, as, as a unit, a pregnant woman and a baby are one unit. Mm. And it's not until the baby takes it, so that we're femifesting, okay? So it's not until the baby takes its first breath that it becomes a separate unit. Mm -hmm. It's that moving into its own person, mm -hmm. taking taking that first life-giving breath that is, is it, its own. You know, it, mm -hmm. the mother didn't have to give it to it. It had to find that life force and become not an it, but a real baby. I had my last two uh, babies at home. And when I came to Phoenix, we created the baby buggy program so that we could ha we had a, a way in which if there was some thing, something that needed to have one or the other or transported or something, we had the equipment we could transport. And it was, as a matter of fact, it, it created communities because it was this huge van with a, a 
stork painted blue and, and the stork painted on the side. And when when I or the midwife went to the house, we would park this baby buggy outside. And so the whole neighborhood knew what was going on in that house. Mm -hmm. You know, this baby's coming. <laughs> so it was like it, it brought the neighborhood together. You, uh, I'm thinking about, I'm just watching you right now. I'm thinking she could be doing whatever she wants right now. Right. And, yeah. and so could I, and yeah. yet you're investing and spending energy in other human beings. And of all the things in your book that made me, well, not of all, one of the things I can't even pick one. And I can't even pick one out of today. So when we're going to finish this, I'm going to tell everybody at the dinner I'm going to tonight about our conversation. They're going to ask me to pick <laughs> one thing, and I can't. And nobody that's listening to the show can pick one thing. It's too profound. But you say in number six in the book, spend your energy wildly. And a lot of people think, I don't know, rest, take it easy. You'll live longer if you do that. And a lot of people kind of hit me like, why are you so engaged in your life? You know, And I don't know that I've ever answered it very well. But I almost feel like you gave me permission. What do you, you don't, you have a 10 year plan and you're 102 years old, right? Right. You actually yeah. have a 10 year I'm plan. 102 and a half. And, so. a, <laughs> and a half. My great a grandkids, my great grandkids say that. So I can say it too. 102 no. and a half. Yeah. Well, what's this notion of spend your energy wildly? Well, you know, you, you if you try to save it, it doesn't work. And, and <laughs> wow. a lot of times when we uh, tell a patient, you know, you're, you you have such and such and you really need to go home and rest. Yeah. They think that you are saying you have to go home and do nothing. Mm -hmm. But to go home and rest is to do something. Going home for a rest is actually a prescription for you to do something you go home and you rest then you're not just doing nothing you're you're allowing your energy to do what it needs to do which is sort of refocus itself and do whatever it needs to do but it's not putting it in a bank and then having to go and pull it out again or something like that it's something that that has to be allowed to be something yes and so to to be resting is a very good thing mm -hmm. if that's what you're supposed to be doing but if you have like i have a patient not too long ago who was retired from the work that she'd been doing and she'd been resting and she had lost all of her juice that she thought she was saving you yes, know? yes, and yes, so we yes. Had to reconnect her with her juice. Oh my gosh. You're just unbelievably awesome. Like you're just <laughs> unbelievably Ooh. awesome. You are. I um okay, I got two more things for you. I, okay. I I tell you what, I would love to have you come back on. Would you come okay. back on again? Uh-huh. I okay, I would love that. We'll do okay. we, we there's just too many things I want to ask you, but Two things. You met Gandhi at one point in your life, correct? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You, what did you learn from Gandhi, if anything? Well, it was one of the uh, experiences that you don't forget, okay? Yeah. We were, uh, the family was in the process of on a train going from uh, the Rurikey down to Bombay to get on a boat and come to the States because every seven and a half years, my parents had a furlough. And so I was on the train and we the train started slowing down because there was a huge crowd, but there are always crowds around in India, you know, but there was this whole crowd and they were chanting and saying something. And I saw up ahead of them that this man with just a small man with a large lati, which is the mm -hmm. staff, and his dhoti, which is the 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 dhoti that he wears around loincloth mm -hmm. and he's walking along and um comes right about outside of my window just not not out 
outside the river in my light of vision mm -hmm. and stoops down and a little girl is handing him a flower. And when he's pick, he hands, takes the flower from the little girl, he looks up and looks straight into my eyes. Now, nobody can tell me he didn't do it. <laughs> nobody can tell me what happened, but mm -hmm. I knew at that time there was something there. And so I can I can still conjure up that look, you know, it was oh. it was just sometimes a newborn baby can look at you like that. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes there's there's a connection with you and another person that is there. Mm -hmm. And um and that's what happened. So well, you know, I I took it in, and and, uh, and thirty years later, when India partition happened and the Hindus were killing the Mahamans, you know, there was such awful stuff. My parents and my brother Carl, who was a a, a, a physician, had a little mobile unit that they were traveling around to the camps where the people were having. And and my dad and mother were working with Gandhi, talking to the people about from the stage about trying to get some kind of movement of life that would he help to heal this whole thing, and um, so they they were, became friends. And I was in uh, college at the time, so you know I was here in the states, but the, my parents were out there working with Gandhi. And when they, uh, at one point, Gandhi gave my mother a a, a Kashmiri shawl, which I have here in my house, and my dad a put a blanket because they respected each other so much that it was one of those things that I still connect with the uh, time that I had connected with Gandhi at uh, when I was 10 years old. Mm. I think what you're saying there, too, is that, um, by the way, this is an experience I'll never forget. And I think what you mean by that is that there's an energy when you meet certain people yes. and that that's what life really is. You talk so much about energy, the way that we use it, the way that we give it to other people. And I think everybody, one of the lessons today is just to be conscious of energy, conscious of oh. your you're, you're you're always making people feel something so take yeah. take be be intentional about what those things are and you're always making yourself feel something absolutely about that. yeah and you're when you're aware of it it really is a teacher hmm. when you become aware of what this what you're doing no matter whether it's, it's a pleasant well not I'm almost said no matter whether it's good or bad, but it's not that. Yeah. I don't mean that. I mean, it's, energy is energy. Yep. And and whatever it is, it is. Hmm. It's beautifully said. I, I don't know. I don't know. I I, uh, I didn't know that this was going to affect me as much as it did today. And it really, Thank really did. You. It touches me, too. <laughs> hmm. I'm deeply moved by you and your work. And... Uh, I'm speaking for millions of people. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for finding your voice at 93. Yeah. Thank you for thank having you. that dream. Thank you for listening to that dream. And thank you for what you do. And thank you for allowing me to, to say it, to talk about it. I'm quite grateful. This is one of those experiences I will never forget. And thank so you. I I, uh, I can't wait for the world to hear this. So everybody, <laughs> make sure that you get Dr. Gladys McGarry's book. The Well-Lived Life, 102-Year-Old Doctor, Six Secrets to Health, Happiness at Every Age. All right, everybody. God bless you. While you're getting it, grab the power of one more Ed Milet's book. I hear that's pretty good, too. And share, the, <laughs> and share this episode with as many people as you can who just want to live a better life and want to learn from someone who's got unbelievable wisdom. God bless you, everybody. Bye.